Hello, and welcome to Vendor Trash. Is the title a reference to my opinions, my drawing skills, or both? That's for you to decide. The thesis for this video is a simple but probably controversial one, which is that I think allied races were a mistake. Now by no means does this mean I don't enjoy allied races, quite the contrary, my main is a Nightborn, and their existence has allowed me to have a different race for each class. But just like eating a bunch of sugar for breakfast, I think it's important for us to be able to recognize that just because something is fun, doesn't mean it's a good idea. Allied races were first revealed with the Battle for Azeroth announcement trailer. The six that were on display were Lightforged Draenei, Dark Iron Dwarves, and Void Elves for the Alliance, and Nightborn, Zandalari, and High Mountain Torn for the Horde. And like much of Battle for Azeroth, this just reeks of a short-term marketing strategy and not planning ahead. Because obviously, this was massively exciting. At this point in the game, we were used to there being 13 playable races, 7 per faction. This trailer bumped it up to 19, by the end of BFA we'd be sitting at 23, and now with the introduction of Irvin, we're gonna be at 25 playable races. And the hype surrounding allied races was crazy. Not only were people excited for the races that we were getting, but there was endless speculation throughout the expansion about what races could be coming in the future. And of course, more options for the players always sounds good, but there's repercussions for every decision you make. And adding new races to the game is probably the second most impactful thing you can do after adding a new class. Granted, it is a far second from that, but adding a race is still making a commitment moving forward. A commitment that is gonna eat up resources and attention for the rest of the game's lifespan. Or at least that's how it should be. In all but a few cases, it feels like the allied races were pretty much forgotten after their introduction. Which then begs the question, should they have been added in the first place? But we'll run through and evaluate them one by one in just a moment. I'd also like to draw attention to the oft-ignored concept of opportunity cost. The fact of the matter is, every race that gets added to the game actually decreases the chance of another race being added in the future, because there isn't some preset list of races that are all going to be added at some point. And though there's no hard number, there is an effective limit on how many races can be added to the game. It already feels a bit absurd looking at the character creation screen and seeing 25 options. Imagine how it'd feel if that ballooned to 35 or 40, and imagine the consequences of having that many races. The same concept applies to classes. I don't mean to knock evokers because I do enjoy them to an extent, but their announcement did kind of bum me out because we basically can only get one new class every two or three expansions. If you wanted Tinker or something else, have fun waiting. There were also some invisible costs that came with allied races. The simple fact of the matter is, getting a new race isn't really exciting anymore. Look back at the Burning Crusade. Draenei and Blood Elves being added to the mix was massive, not only because going from 4 to 5 races per faction was a 25% increase, but they were able to ensure that both Blood Elves and Draenei had a very palpable presence in the game. Not only for TBC, but going forward as well. The Cataclysm races were still pretty exciting, even if they weren't quite as impactful. Goblins were sort of a it's about time thing for the Horde, and Worgen being a playable race did take a little bit getting used to, but I think both were very sensible and very satisfying additions to the game. Though admittedly, both races could have used some more attention, both in Cataclysm and going forward. And then of course we have the Pandaren with Mists of Pandaria. No one in their right mind would argue that they weren't a significant significant part of that expansion. Their inclusion was very deliberate. And admittedly, they too have sort of fallen by the wayside since then, but I don't think that that's a problem simply shared with allied races. It's a problem exacerbated by them. Simply put, nowadays there are just too many characters and too many races to juggle. Blizzard already tends to play favorites with their races. Humans, Night Elves, Blood Elves, and Orcs probably get the lion's share of attention. But even if we were to perfectly divide attention between all of the races, things would still feel scant. And I'm not saying every race needs to constantly be brought back to the forefront, because simply speaking that doesn't feel natural either, but the fact that races like Volpera will probably never get a storyline focused on them again says a lot. And having so many races around mean a bunch of them are sort of stepping on each other's toes in terms of narrative and thematic focus. 
It's all deteriorated the excitement that used to surround a new race reveal. This even affects non-allied races like the Drakthir. Granted, that race was accompanied by some disappointment that we weren't getting Drakonid instead, but do you know anyone who was jumping out of their seat when Drakthir were announced? Even if fan favorite requests like Ogres, Ethereals, or Naga were suddenly announced, I don't think the hype would be on the same level as if allied races had never happened. There'd definitely be some hype, but not as much. Another general issue with the allied races is that a lot of the ones they went for just feel kind of weird, and what qualifies each one as an allied race seems to be a bit inconsistent. In fact, the only thing consistent among 10 of the 11 allied races is that they all allowed Blizzard to take shortcuts. But even here, we have Cool Tyrans as an outlier, because to my knowledge, this race does use an entirely new rig. So then what even is an allied race? And Blizzard did seem quite proud of the fact that they could use pre-existing assets to pump out these races more easily. But let me ask you this, is the addition of a new playable race in your role-playing game really where you want to be cutting corners? I would think not. But let's get out of the general and into specifics. We'll kick things off with Lightforge Draenei. Does anyone actually disagree that these should have just been a customization for regular Draenei? Their cultures are nearly identical, with LFDs basically just being super Draenei because they're infused with the light. Their main physical differences are just some body markings that will probably get covered up by your armor anyways, some darker skin tones, and yellow eyes. And they have unique voice lines, but that's about it. Their racial leader is ostensibly Captain Faria, but she wasn't even that prominent in 7.3 and has done nothing since the recruitment quests. One could argue that Turalyon is actually the racial leader, but that's dumb. He's not a Draenei. <laughs> Which sort of becomes a running theme for the Alliance allied races. Though shout out to Worgen because they also aren't led by a Worgen anymore. I pity you guys, I really do. But it got even more absurd when Dragonflight added the Minari customization to Draenei. Now whether you agree with that decision or not, I think we can all agree that it makes absolutely no sense for LFDs to be an allied race and Minari to be a customization. The latter is far more distinct, even if it would still reuse the skeleton and everything. And the real reason why things unfolded that way is just that LFD were added when Blizzard was doing their allied race binge, and Minari were added when they weren't adding new races. Plus, if they're giving Minari to the Alliance, they would have had to come up with something to give the Horde. It was entirely a result of development, and the outcome we got is ludicrous. Moving on, we have Dark Iron Dwarves, which do manage to feel a little more distinct, but in reality, they could have just been customization options. That's ultimately what Wildhammer Dwarves wound up being, and with all three of these clans supposedly being equals, why were they handled so differently? Again, they have their own voice lines and customizations, but they very clearly use the same rig as regular dwarves. They also aren't even led by a member of their own race. Moira became the de facto leader because she married their previous emperor, and she now serves as regent until Dagrin can take the throne. But Dagrin's existence is even more reason why this shouldn't have been an allied race. If he's supposed to be the one that unites all three dwarf clans under one banner, then all three clans could comfortably fit under the singular dwarf playable race, and that race would be all the more rich in lore for it. Moving on, we have Void Elves, and where do you even begin with these lore abominations? Their very first appearance was in the BFA Features trailer. In the lore, they're just a subset of Blood Elves who tampered with the Void and were kicked out as a result. This means they are a portion of an already decimated population. If you were to tell me that they're canonically less than 50 Void Elves in existence, I would buy it. Like with LFDs, they're just their base race, but infused with an element, which I think is kind of dumb. And also very similar to LFDs, their racial leader plays second fiddle. Their supposed leader is Magister Umbric, who at least has done more than Faria. He did have some quests during BFA and showed up again for the Harbinger quest chain. But he's clearly overshadowed by Illyria, who is a high elf who can temporarily change her form with a void power-up. But it's perhaps fitting that they are led by a high elf, considering that's the real reason they were added. No prospective race in the game has gotten nearly as much love from the fanbase as high elves. And void elves were clearly Blizzard trying to give this crowd what they wanted, 
without having to go so far as to actually implement High Elves. But over time, the customization options for Void Elves have expanded so much that you can easily play one and pretend that you are a High Elf. Now personally, I'm a spiteful little gremlin who always said, screw those players. Blood Elves already exist as a dark twist on the Tolkien-esque pretty elf fantasy, and the Lions has no shortage of pretty races as it is. So why muddy the waters by giving sort of the same thing to both factions? That being said, I think everyone can agree that High Elves would have been a much better option than Void Elves. Heck, if you want to make them more distinct, give them facial markings like Illyria and treat them like Wildhammer Elves. I don't know, anything's better than what we got. Right now, Void Elves just exist as a half measure that doesn't keep anyone satisfied. I think the subset of players that wanted Elves, but specifically wanted them to have tentacle hair is actually pretty small. Now I know I'm in dangerous territory here because Void Elves are like the fifth most played race, so there's a lot of you out there. But even if you and I wanted different things, I think we can both agree that Blizzard could have done better. It's also worth noting that these guys were tied to the Argusian Reach reputation, which was far more thematically tied to Broken. So any players who wanted Broken had to absolutely be in shambles after this. Now then, let's move on to Mecha Gnomes, or as much of the community finally refers to them as, Diaper Gnomes. Funnily enough, I think that moniker could have been completely avoided had they just been a customization option. It's the fact that it's an entire playable race that basically can't wear pants that draws so much attention to it. They do have a leg up on most allied races in that they actually have unique dances. But I think we all know that going forward, any Mecha Gnome lore we're going to get is just going to get rolled in with the regular Gnome lore. Heck, the Mecha Gnome leader, Prince Erasmin, basically swore fealty to Mecha Torque as king of all gnomes. So you know they're not going to be a distinct entity going forward. But hey, at least their racial leader is a member of that race, I'll give them that. Let's jump over to the Horde side for a bit with High Mountain Torin. Again. Just make these customization options. They're literally just torn with antlers and some facial markings. Aside from voice lines, they share all their other assets with regular Torin. And culturally, they're basically the same thing as well. Their leader, Mela High Mountain, is at least a High Mountain Torin, but she's basically joined at the hip to Bane and has done nothing independent of him since the recruitment quests. I'm honestly shocked Blizzard hasn't made them a canonical couple yet. Then we have Meghar Orcs who again, should have just been customization options. Yes, these are the pure orcs who managed to steer clear of the demonic influence of the Legion. But with the exception of warlocks, modern greenskin orcs feel the same way. Culturally, there's very little difference. And again, the only thing that sets them apart, other than the customizations, are their voice lines. Their leader, Overlord Gaera, is basically a nobody. Her biggest claim to fame is just that she's A.U. Duratan and Draka's daughter. She's done basically nothing, and I'm recording this before the War Within launches, but I do know she shows up, but I believe it's just to train some troops. So, not much of anything. At the very least, you could have given us Grom, that would have been kinda cool. But yeah, not much more to say on them. Next we have the Nightborn, who I absolutely adore. Some people like to say that they're basically just Night Elves for the Horde, but I disagree. Sure, they evolved from Night Elves, but so did High Elves, so I don't think that carries much weight. Aesthetically and culturally, they feel extremely different. Of all the races, I've mentioned so far, these are probably the strongest candidate for an actual distinct race. Like, they just wouldn't make sense as a customization option. But despite all of my love for them, I still don't necessarily think they should have been added as a playable race. Their story and their themes are extremely similar to that of Blood Elves. Both have or did have magical wells that gave them power, both suffered with an addiction problem related to that power, and both have sort of a refined, elegant, but almost snooty culture to them. So having both them and Blood Elves be playable actually takes away a little bit from both of them. And this is exemplified by the fact that our leader, First Arcanist the Lysra, got hitched to Lorthamar. I know a lot of people love this pairing, but I despise it. Which is weird because I was pretty okay with both characters on their own. And I do plan to make a full video on this ship and why I don't support it, but the part that matters for this video is that it contributes to the erasure of Nightborn as a distinct and unique feeling entity. Because I do feel that Nightborn, if they were going to be added, should have been a proper race. Like, it feels weird to me that they still share dances with Night Elves. But being a main race is something I believe also applies to our next allied race, the Volpera. More than any other race on this list, 
they are their own thing. They aren't a subgroup of another race. They didn't evolve from another race that we know of. They're just these adorable desert-dwelling fox people. And I love them for it. They're adorable. I know they share their skeleton with goblins, but they at least give them their own dances, so that's neat. Their racial leader is, again, actually a Volpera. But as I alluded to earlier, where the race does fall short, is the fact that they're not important to the lore. You know they're gonna have basically zero narrative focus for the rest of the game's lifespan. And maybe you don't think that matters, but I do. So despite my love for the race, I find it hard to justify their addition. All right, we're getting in the home stretch here. I'm gonna talk about the Kul Tirans and the Zandalari Trolls together. I did touch on the fact that Kul Tirans have completely unique rigs, whereas I believe Zandalari Trolls use modified Night Elf rigs, but those have been so heavily modified that they feel wholly unique. Perhaps because their home continents were the focus of the start of the expansion, I feel like both of these got a ton of love. They have their own dances, and because we're visiting their homeland, they have their own capital cities. That isn't something you've been able to truly say since Draenei and Blood Elves. Seriously, these two races are the closest thing we got to an old school race edition. And honestly, even though in the lore they're not that distinct from regular humans or dark spear trolls, I think if anything, they should have just been the two new races added in Battle for Azeroth. Heck, to the credit of Cool Tyrans, they feel extremely culturally distinct from other humans, and one could even argue biologically distinct, what with their history of the Drust, which while mostly antagonistic, did feature a splinter group that integrated into Cool Tyran society and surely contributed their genes, which helps explain how Cool Tyran druids are possible. Anyway, both races do have a representative of their race as their leaders. I know Jaina doesn't use the Cool Tyran female model, but I'm willing to let that slide. After all, the same could have been said about Sylvanas, and I was absolutely fine with her leading the Forsaken. And lastly, we have the Urthen the first allied race to be added since Battle for Azeroth. And unfortunately, I can't say much on their culture or story. I've tried to avoid getting spoiled too heavily for The War Within. But yeah, when other people say who asked for a third dwarf race, they aren't wrong. I'm sure they're more distinct than Dark Iron Dwarves were, but still. As a Horde player, I at least get to be excited that I have a new model to play with, even though it feels kind of weird that they're gonna be dwarves in the Horde. And I feel like they were maybe just made an allied race to have that little bit extra to help sell the expansion. But hey, I think they at least have their own dances. Yes, I do need to keep bringing that up. So yeah, overall, allied races are an absolute mess. It felt like there was very little rhyme or reason to which ones were added, and despite my love for many of them, I feel their addition to the game was probably detrimental overall. Many should have just been customization options, some should have never been added, and some should have been added as main races. We can disagree on which ones belong in which category. And as much as I would like to believe that one day Blizzard will go back and sort of clean up allied races, making them what they should have been, I know that it will probably never happen because it essentially means they would have to delete certain races from the game, even if it was entirely possible to still create characters that looked exactly the same. Oh boy, that was a lot to talk about, and we've still got the drama for this week. Since we're talking about allied races, I decided to go with one of their leaders, but not one I'm likely to talk about elsewhere, but one that I do still like. So I went with Prince Erasmin, because who doesn't love Robin's voice? He's not the most complicated character, but he's a fun guy to have around. Having just finished my Mechagon Peacekeeper farm a few months ago, I've had plenty of exposure to his voice lines. And I love how candid he is about the fact that we will need to employ violence. And you know, since Mechatork hasn't had that interesting of a run as a character, I think it would have worked had Mechanomes just been a customization option for regular gnomes if Harazmin had wound up being made leader for all of them. Heck, Mechatork almost died anyways, so you wouldn't have had to even rewrite that much. But yeah, for the drawing itself, I'm pretty satisfied with how it came out. I will say the mechanical bits were a bit hard to get right. I've never been particularly good at drawing that stuff. It's a bit too precise. And obviously for the background, I went with Mechagon. I actually think it's a pretty nice looking zone. It's basically a less damp version of Tearguard sound. That being said, if you actually went there, it would be a living nightmare. All of the killer robots aside, you know the place has to be absolutely coated with rust. And or have rust floating in the air. I mean, the main faction there is literally called the Rust Bolt Resistance. And for those who haven't really been around rust that much in their lives, let me inform you that that stuff is disgusting. So yeah, a fun place to look at, a horrible place to actually go. Anyway, that's all I have for now. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next week. Buh bye bye